sea route that would connect Europe to the riches of Asia. It's there somewhere over the north of the continent of America. So was the thought in the minds of thousands of merchants, explorers and kings in an obsession that would grip the seafaring nations of Europe for four centuries. If only they knew the truth of the Arctic archipelago of northern Canada. A barren, frozen complex of land and sea about as hostile an environment as any to be found on Earth. A crusher of ships, and the grave of those arrogant enough to believe it was theirs to conquer. This is infamous geography. This is the Northwest Passage. The year is 1492. Columbus has discovered the Americas for Europe. The driving force behind this expedition was simple, to find a route between Europe and Asia. Many trade goods at that time, such as spices and silk, were in high demand in Europe, but were extremely expensive, with some worth more than their weight in gold. The reason for such high prices was due to these goods travelling overland, passing through many intermediaries along the way, each taking their cut. So whoever could find an alternative sea route that would bypass these middlemen was destined to become fabulously rich. Of course, Columbus wasn't actually the first European to reach the Americas. As confirmed by discoveries in Newfoundland, Canada in the 1960s, Vikings reached this coast around the year 1000. Additionally, Columbus had thought he had discovered the Orient when he'd landed on Hispaniola Island in the Caribbean, having badly miscalculated the size of the Earth. In fact, he was wrong by an entire ocean, the Pacific, whose width is almost half the size of the entire planet, as would be later discovered by Magellan in his expedition some 30 years later. With both continents connected by land at the Isthmus of Panama, in order to reach the Orient, Magellan had had to skirt the entire eastern coast of South America before finding the straits that now bear his name at the very bottom of that continent within touching distance of Antarctica. For centuries this would be the only western route to the Orient, and was a diversion of many thousands of miles into the southern hemisphere, since of course Europe and Asia were both in the northern hemisphere. An alternative was needed to this unsatisfactory state of affairs, there must be a way around the top of the American continents, a quicker way to get to the riches of Asia, were the thoughts of dozens of merchants, monarchs and explorers at this time. But little did these men realise that they were dealing with one of the most hostile and challenging places on Earth. Such a route became known as the Northwest Passage, and over the next four centuries this geography would be their undoing. Before we look at such expeditions, however, let us examine the geography at the top of the Americas itself. North America ends in an archipelago stretching from the mainland of Canada to within a few degrees of the North Pole. And at first glance, it would appear that the proposition of a sea route through this area would be a straightforward dash through a wide channel running across the centre of these islands. Alas, this is not to be the case, for the range of latitudes we are talking about here are all north of the Arctic Circle at 67 degrees north. Here we have an Arctic tundra climate, where summer temperatures rarely exceed 10 degrees Celsius, resulting in a barren tundra landscape with no trees. Winter temperatures often fall to 50 degrees below, with blizzards common, since these latitudes frequently experience storms from the low pressures in this boundary between the polar and mid-latitude cells of global air circulation. The temperatures are so low in winter that the sea itself freezes, preventing any passage by ship during the cold season. What is even more challenging for navigation is that this ice can become so thick that it will not fully melt even by the end of the summer. Sea ice and its various dynamics 
are a relatively complex subject, and so I will not delve into it beyond the comments above, which make it hazardous or impossible for sea navigation, and the additional factor of the various pressures and interactions that occur between ice under the influence of sea currents versus ice that is fastened to coastlines. These interactions can often create a buckling and tearing of the ice, leading to a tortured landscape that can be very difficult and time-consuming to traverse on foot or with sledges. Furthermore, the unpredictable melting of such ice in the spring and summer creates additional complications for such modes of transport. The upshot of this is that, in the Canadian Arctic, the sea ice acts as a barrier to both land and sea navigation, and last but not least, if that wasn't all bad enough, the magnetic North Pole lies within this region, making navigation by compass confusing. With GPS navigation negating this latter effect in the last 20 years, the area is nonetheless regarded as one of the most difficult places in the world to travel across by land or sea today. At this time, with the advent of satellite imagery, the topography of this region is fully mapped and known, so let's take a moment to familiarise ourselves with the key islands, bays and channels that the seekers of the Northwest Passage would have had to face. At the eastern end of the archipelago, we have Greenland, the world's largest island and home to the world's second largest ice cap after Antarctica. The wide Labrador Sea between the namesake province of Canada and Greenland is the first part of the navigation one would face coming from Europe and the Atlantic. We are then confronted with the presence of Baffin Island, the largest in the archipelago after Greenland, and presented with a choice of going north or south around it. South would seem the most tempting route as being at a lower latitude should present warmer, more ice-free seas. But in fact, this route just leads one into Hudson Bay, with the only narrowest of straits, the Fury and Hecla, separating Baffin Island from the mainland and one which is icebound for almost all of the year. The north side of Baffin Island has clearer waters for navigation in the wide Davis Strait between it and Greenland, and at the western end of Baffin, the 70 km wide Lancaster Sound is formed between it and Devon Island to the north. Another southward possibility, Prince Region Inlet and the Gulf of Boothia, opens up not far into this channel, but this is in fact a dead end, with the Boothia Peninsula being effectively part of the mainland all the way up to Lancaster Sound, since only the very narrow Balot Strait, separating it and Somerset Island, is icebound most of the year and when it's not, subject to treacherous currents. Continuing along Lancaster Sound and past Boothia, we are offered another southerly channel down past Prince of Wales Island and King William Island, and a channel then westwards between Victoria Island and the mainland and out into the open Arctic Ocean beyond. More on this route later. Lancaster Sound becomes the Barrow Strait, then Viscount Melville Sound as it continues west between Victoria and Bathurst Island, and then the McClure Strait running northwest between Melville and Banks Islands before reaching the open Arctic. Altogether, this east-west channel, referred overall as the Parry Channel, is no narrower than 50 kilometres, so it should be the best candidate for navigation. However, owing to its more northerly route compared to the narrower but more southerly route below Victoria Island, sea ice is significantly thicker. Owing to its forbidding climate and the land's inability to support agriculture, the region as a whole is extremely sparsely populated. That population that does exist, however, has become expert in its ability to survive in such a hostile environment. The Arctic Archipelago is home to the Inuit peoples, who some may still know as Eskimos, but this term is inaccurate and by some Inuit considered to be offensive due to its overtones of earlier colonialism. The Inuit have lived in this region over the last millennium, subsisting from the icy waters that are extremely rich in fish populations and their dependent populations of seals, the latter of which the Inuit use for meat and their blubber for cooking and heating oil. They clothe themselves in the warm hides of caribou, and these nomadic people have domesticated wolves into a means of propulsion across land in the form of sled dogs. Their ability to survive the brutal Arctic winters by expertly cutting out the very snow itself into houses, or igloos, demonstrates their mastery of this environment. The use or neglect of these native people to assist in expeditions would later determine who would succeed in their quest for the Northwest Passage, and who would fail, sometimes in total disaster. So, that's the geography. 
But how did the discovery of the Northwest Passage play out? It took many expeditions over four long centuries before explorers, travelling from both east and west, penetrated its secrets and finally permitted a traversal by one vessel. The explorers of the 16th century knew little to nothing of this forbidding world when they set out with such optimism on their voyages of discovery, with the belief by many that there was an open sea in the Arctic, free of ice, as late as the mid-19th century. It can seem incredible, knowing what we know of today about this region and its difficulties, that so many explorers had such optimism that a way through could be found despite the persistent failures of their predecessors. Remember, Magellan's expedition completed its circumnavigation of the world as early as 1522, so a lack of maritime skill was not really a barrier to exploring the world, but each explorer in his own way, lulled by the potential of fame and riches upon success, ended up believing too much in their own assured destinies. But for all except one, there would be only disappointment, and for some, even their death. The first known expedition to discover Asia via a northern route was made in 1497 by John or Giovanni Cabot, an Italian sponsored by the English crown. He was the first European since Viking times to reach the North American continent, specifically the coast of either Newfoundland or Nova Scotia. An expedition led by his son Sebastian in 1509 supposedly sailed up the coast of Labrador and possibly as far as the entrance to Hudson Bay, but this is unverified. Jacques Cartier, a French Breton explorer, launched three expeditions between 1534 and 1541, aimed at finding a route to Asia through the heart of the North American continent and was the first European to discover and map the St. Lawrence Seaway between the Atlantic and Great Lakes. He reached as far as present-day Montreal, before being turned back by the rapids there. The present-day district of La Chine was named by him after China, so convinced was Cartier that the rapids were all that stood between him and the riches of Asia beyond. The English mariner Martin Frobisher conducted three voyages between 1576 and 1578 and was the first to discover Baffin Island. He was followed soon after by another Englishman, John Davis, who in 1585 and 86 mapped much of the coast of Baffin and Greenland, and to whom the Strait Between was named. Henry Hudson of England launched two expeditions to discover the northern route to Asia. In 1609 he explored the river that bears his name today, reaching as far as Albany, New York, before turning back. Two years later he was the first European to enter the vast bay that also bears his name, Wanting to press on after spending the winter there, his crew mutinied and cast him and his son adrift in an open boat. They were never seen again. Hudson Bay was further probed for a passage through to Asia three years later by Welshman Thomas Button, but only the western coast of that bay was found with no way through. Robert Bylot, the first mate on Hudson's expedition, returned to the Canadian Arctic on several expeditions in the following years, with the most notable being in 1616 when accompanied by pilot William Baffin, they circumnavigated Baffin Bay and discovered the entrance to Lancaster Sound. The expedition's findings, that there was to be no passage this far north due to thick ice, meant that all future efforts would be focused further south. The large island and the bay was named after Baffin and not Bylot, however, due to Bylot's role in the earlier mutiny with Hudson. It would be another 200 years before progress was made from the Atlantic side. Meanwhile, explorers in the Pacific had been venturing up the western coast of North America, as well as Russian advances from Siberia, in an attempt to find the Northwest Passage's western entry. The Bering Strait separating Asia from North America was named after Danish Navy officer Vitas Bering in the service of the Russians in 1728, but was actually discovered by the Russian Semyon Dejeov in 1648. But it was Bering who was the first to correctly conclude that the two continents were indeed fully separated by these waters. The Spanish conducted a number of expeditions up the western coast of North America throughout the 1700s in an attempt to find the passage, but to no avail. In 1745, the British Parliament offered a £20,000 prize to whoever discovered the passage, 
an enormous sum at that time. Captains James Cook and George Vancouver, in separate expeditions in the latter part of that century, extensively mapped the complex western coast of Canada and southern Alaska, and confirmed that no passage existed south of the Bering Strait. The Canadian and Washington state cities in the Pacific Northwest bear Vancouver's name as part of his legacy of charting so much of that area. The early to mid-1800s saw a renewed effort on the part of the British Admiralty to find a passage from the Atlantic, with numerous expeditions launched. In 1818, the Scotsman Sir John Ross sailed anticlockwise around Baffin Bay until coming to the entrance of Lancaster Sound, where a mirage mistook him for thinking mountains blocked the way, and he returned to England despite the protestations of one of his lieutenants, William Edward Parry. The following year, Parry returned, passing 600 miles west of the earlier mountain mirage, and in the process discovered the main east-west channel that bears his name today. Sir John's nephew, James Clark Ross, headed an expedition in 1829, looking for a southern route down from Lancaster Sound into the Gulf of Boothia, before concluding that this was a dead end. During this time, multiple overland expeditions mapped various parts of the northern Canadian coast to assist in the general search for the passage, so by the mid-1800s, only the middle section of the passage was still unknown. And so we come to the most famous of the expeditions to discover the Northwest Passage, and perhaps the one that marks this area of the world more than any other as infamous geography. The doomed Franklin Expedition of 1845. In that year, two large state-of-the-art Royal Navy vessels, HMS Erebus and HMS Terra, equipped with reinforced ice-breaking hulls and steam-powered propellers, set out under the command of Sir John Franklin with 129 crew. After arriving into the Canadian Arctic late in the season, the ships wintered on Beachy Island before setting out south down Peel Sound toward the poorly chartered King William Island in the spring and summer of 1846. They became trapped in the ice just off the western coast of that island in September of that year, and it is believed never sailed again. Only handwritten notes left within brass canisters, deposited within cairns upon the island, provide a testimony, as the ships themselves were not found until very recently. But it is understood that the ice held the ships solid throughout the summer of 1847. Franklin died in June of that year of unknown causes, leaving Terra's captain, Irishman Francis Crozier, in charge of the expedition. By the spring of 1848, it appears that the ships were abandoned in the ice, with a note penned by Crozier saying that they intended to overland it through the still unknown reaches south of King William Island to Bax River on the mainland and eventual civilization. The notes were the last communications ever found of the crew, and they were never seen again. The fate of the expedition gripped the society of both Victorian Britain and America at that time, with numerous expeditions launched by sea and land in an attempt to find it after three years of receiving no news. Scotsman John Ray was the most successful of these, heading out overland in early 1848. He worked with the local Inuit people to eventually reach King William Island, where scattered artifacts of the expedition were found, along with human remains. Together with fragmented stories from local tribes, Ray pieced together a story of the final fate of the expedition, that being the remaining crew of the Erebus and Terra hauling the heavy auxiliary boats full of provisions from the ships across the ice and land had finally succumbed to exhaustion and starvation, with the possibility of cannibalism. Upon his return to London, Ray's report was met with a mixture of shock, grief, and to the polite society of the time, disbelief and revulsion that men of the British Navy would resort to eating their own. Today there is still controversy over whether the cut marks found on the bones of the human remains were a result of cannibalism or combat, and various other theories such as poisoning due to poorly heated or soldered tinned food and even attacks by local Inuit still persist. But what is known is that all 129 sailors were never seen again. The ships were lost to history for almost 170 years, until they were discovered recently, 
Erebus in 2014, Terror in 2016. At the time of this video, the cabin of Francis Crozier aboard the Terror has still not been explored. When it is, it is expected to reveal the captain's log, and finally answer what happened on this expedition, one of the greatest disasters in exploration history. It was in one of the expeditions that was searching for Franklin that the final section of the Northwest Passage was discovered. In 1850, Irishman Robert McClure, travelling eastward from the Bering Strait and past the Icy Point Barrow, sailed along the northern coast of Alaska and today's Northwest Territories before discovering the Prince of Wales Sound separating Banks and Victoria Islands. His ship, Investigator, became icebound by September of that year, but sensing he was close, headed a sledge party north up the strait. On the 21st of October 1850, McClure was able to confirm that the strait did in fact connect the Western Arctic with the Parry Strait earlier explored from the Atlantic, and that a Northwest Passage had been found even though they could not traverse it due to the thick ice. McClure's expedition almost met the fate of that of Franklin's, with three winters in the ice around Banks Island, and the crew faced with scurvy and exhaustion, forced to abandon their ice-bound ship, and barely escaping with their lives across the ice to another Royal Navy ship anchored off Melville Island. So although the passage was now known, it took another 50 years before a vessel was able to navigate it end-to-end. -end. You've probably heard of the man who was to achieve this, the first man to reach the North and South Poles, the Norwegian legend of polar exploration, Roald Amundsen. Where the Royal Navy, with vast ships and crew had failed, and died, Amundsen was able to succeed in just a relatively small fishing vessel, the Ewer. Amundsen's journey in the summer of 1903, initially followed the same trajectory as that of Franklin, sailing up the Davis Strait and then entering Lancaster Sound, before heading south past the Boothia Peninsula, before wintering in a natural harbour on the southeast coast of King William Island, which, incidentally, is now the only permanent settlement on that island and named after the famed ship. Like Franklin also, the ship remained icebound over the next two winters, but unlike Franklin, Amundsen had befriended, learned from, and worked with the local Inuit people to ensure that he and his small six-man crew remained adequately nourished from fresh meat gained through hunting. In August of 1905, the ice finally relented, and Amundsen was able to navigate the light vessel through the treacherous straits south of Victoria Island and out into the clear waters beyond. But by October, the vessel once again became iced in, just off the North Alaskan coast, spending yet another winter there before passing the Bering Strait and completing the passage in the summer of 1906. An Inuit elder recently said that Amundsen succeeded through working with his people, whereas Franklin had failed by snubbing or ignoring them. So the passage had finally been traversed, but it had taken three winters to do so, and even then, the route that Amundsen had taken was through shallow straits that were not suitable for deep-draft commercial vessels. It wasn't until 1954 that the first large vessel, the icebreaker HMCS Labrador, completed the passage, and not until 1969 when this first commercial vessel, SS Manhattan, completed the passage, the latter with two necessary icebreaking escort vessels. But after 1914, the Northwest Passage had lost much of its earlier interest and relevance with the completion of the Panama Canal, which now enabled large merchant vessels to pass between the Pacific and Atlantic without needing to take the thousands of miles diversion around Cape Horn. And it was clear to anyone that after so many difficult and costly expeditions, both in money and in lives lost, that the icy waters of the Arctic archipelago we're simply not going to allow an easy or routine passage for any kind of commercial shipping. It is possible that, with climate change and a receding yearly ice pack opening up the channels in the Arctic archipelago to navigation more reliably each year, that this dream may yet still be achieved, but at the time of the production of this video, it has still yet to become a reality. Even if it were physically possible, such a route would only be open in the summer, 
And there is yet a further potential barrier to this route, namely in the form of the Canadian government. Canada insists that the Parry Channel and all others narrower than it are Canadian national waters, whereas the United States and other powers tend to disagree on this point, and think of it as international waters. With the further widening of the Panama Canal completed and open to traffic in 2016, the case for vessels to overcome the obstacles of the Northwest Passage is reduced further, with only the largest supertankers, cruise ships and container vessels unable to fit through the new canal. Today only a handful of commercial vessels have successfully completed the Northwest Passage, a drop in the ocean, pardon the pun, compared to the vast, yearly tonnage passing through the Panama Canal today. So it can safely be said that the dream of the past centuries of finding a fast sea route between Europe and the Orient via the north coast of the Americas was ultimately a failure, and is arguably the longest running and costliest commercial disappointment in history. And that's the Northwest Passage. Please like and share this video if you enjoyed it or found it useful, and please let me know your thoughts in the comments, especially if you've travelled to this region, or if I missed out anything that you feel is important. If you haven't already done so, then please click the subscribe button so you don't miss future episodes. You can also support future development of this channel by becoming a Patreon supporter for as little as $2 a month. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.